This is an intimidatingly large amount of people to speak to, so I just want to acknowledge that at the beginning of this on all of our behalves. Um, I want to begin by making our own acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting and pay our respects to Elders past and present. I want to acknowledge that there's not a person of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent on this panel, which I think is a bit of a shame, but we can work on that in future. And certainly, I think it's important from the beginning just to really... It's very difficult to underestimate the key importance of First Nations art and, arts and culture to the future of this state and to Australia, not just for the tourism and events industry, but also for higher order things around the healing of this place. Um, I, I, I'll do some initial scene setting and then I'll really hand over to my friends here to, to do most of the talking. But the first thing I want to say is that reconciliation as a process in this country, there is no better tool for that than arts and culture. So the way that we come to know each other and the, the, the way of life on this, on, on this land is through arts and culture and people and community. So we can have great political leadership and say that it's really important and write lots of documents, but what this is actually about is connection between people. Conversely, from like an economic perspective and from a visitation perspective, the greatest point of difference that Queensland has is that it has the two oldest living cultures in the world in the one state and no other place can say that. So that's a really important thing that we need to focus on moving into the future. Secondly, we've got Olympics coming. And we know um, from research done by the IOC that the one thing that people remember when they leave the place they visited is the cultural experiences and their sense of community that they have there. So there's the sports carnival that we all go to and that can really be anywhere in the world but the distinctive bit is the culture of the place and that's something that as we move towards the Olympics we really, really, really need to focus on. And then thirdly, in the spirit of being in a room together in a conference, this is about the importance of creating new connections. So all creativity and innovation is about bringing together new different ways of thinking, new ideas. Arts and tourism have often been considered bedfellows but not, you know, completely connected. And, you know, through the conversation today, what we're trying to do is raise awareness of the opportunities, some of the challenges of arts and tourism working together and leave today with a, a, a few kind of key actions that we can take to move forward together as a collective. Does that sound all right? Yes? Great, thank you very much. So I might begin just with talking, uh, asking my, my beloved colleagues about their views on the um, strengths and opportunities that we have, I mean, in line with the conference theme that, that we're dealing with today, is, uh, you know, where we're sitting right now in terms of the, the, the bounty of um, unrealised opportunity that, that exists for us. Kate, you've spent lots of time around the place working in lots of different contexts. What do you think is special about Brisbane? Uh, I think, first of all... Um Joel, as you suggest, it's the First Nations cultures. First, front, mainly. That is such an opportunity for us. That's what people are interested in. I think there's some other cultural opportunities too. I was super impressed. I came back to Brisbane after 18 years being away, working elsewhere. Went to Brisbane Festival. This hugely dynamic Pacifica cultures that are all here on our doorstep. But I think the thing, I'm going to straight away, we've got strengths, but I'm going to straight away put some challenges out there, Joel. Okay. All right, let's get into it. I think the thing is that... Um, People still don't know where Brisbane is internationally. I think that we have not nailed that. This is our chance. If we don't get through the Olympics and nail this proposition to the world, we will not get that again. And what does that look like? I think the tide has turned in terms of what tourism is about. It's about the experience. For me, I'm gonna sum that up with a picture. And that is that you go away, you have a suitcase that is full and you return with exactly the same amount of stuff in that suitcase because you've actually consumed experiences when you're gone. And that's where the future is. Everybody, I've just come back from Europe, 
um, and did a, a big tour for work in Europe. It's a very interesting place right now. It's very tumultuous. And what people are looking for is sustainability. They talk about sustainability all the time. We are sick of stuff. That was the 80s for me. I think where we are now is all about the experience economy. And that we have not nailed yet in Queensland. We've got all these fantastic experiences that occur, but as a joined up um, sense of experience and opportunity, that hasn't happened here yet. The arts is not um, fundamentally understood as the, the, an essential ingredient for that joined up experience economy. So a bit of a negative edge on it, but I think there's opportunity prescient. No, and I think what, what to paraphrase this slightly, I think there's um, a way of looking at the arts role in the experience economy is that it's about diversifying the opportunity that people have to have an authentic experience of place that's not just about the environment, but it's actually through the people and the culture of it, which is what actually makes any place distinctive. And the really famous, um, you know, like tourism destinations of the world have done that very well for a very long time. Louise, you, you have spent, done a whole lot of time with Brisbane Festival thinking about connecting community and, and culture within a broader arts construct. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your vision for that? Yeah, thanks, Joel. Uh, look, I think that what we're trying to create with a festival like Brisbane Festival or any really fabulous festival, and you've already hit the nail on the head, it's a sense of place. Uh, this morning when I was able to listen to some of the other panellists, we're all talking the same language. We're all talking about the experience economy. We're all talking about the fact that people are looking for memories, a, a greater connection to community, and that's where we have an opportunity, just as this conference is all about, in terms of building on our strengths. This is what we can offer in the work that we do. We, we're already doing it and how we build on this and use this moment in time that we have. We've only got 10 years to do it and then there's the 10 years post that, but this is incredibly exciting. One of the great things with the Brisbane Festival, well, I hope anyway, one of the great things uh, about the last three years that whilst it has been incredibly traumatising for so many people in the entertainment and tourism industries is an opportunity to not use that as an obstacle. Uh, for me, my first festival as the artistic director uh, was in 2020. And so we completely deconstructed the festival and took the festival to the entire community with free concerts in 190 suburbs of the city. Uh, and whilst, of course, that didn't uh, meant that we didn't have tourists and travellers and, and so forth coming to the festival, what it meant was we were building a local audience, a demand in our community who hadn't been an access, an access to the festival before. And then we can build on that. So that's what we've been doing. It's been about creating a sense of place, a sense of community. One of our most loved events in the Brisbane Festival, uh, River Fire by Australian Retirement Trust, is one of the most iconic events in this state. We moved it to the opening of the festival this year and it was an excellent thing to do. It's an opportunity to market Brisbane Festival for the next three weeks. We can capitalise on that event now. We open with an event that has 400,000 people that line the riverbanks of the city. We then have a broadcast audience of almost another half a million on Channel 9, our broadcast partner. But now we need to take that event. How does that become uh, a, a stepping stone to an opening ceremony? How do we use our river in a way that brings people together? How do we use our First Nations culture to start to tell significant stories of our place? And that's where I see great opportunity for us uh, from a Brisbane Festival perspective, but generally speaking, festivals, all of the successful arts and cultural festivals that happen around the world have a very unique personality. They come back to their place and they offer something that doesn't look like a cookie cutter program that you would see in any other city of the world. And that is what we have in such a wonderful way in this state, given, of course, our beautiful climate that we get to work and play in as well. Thanks, Louise. Now, JC, 
Uh, you and I love to trot out the stat that live music sells more tickets than sport in Australia, and I'll take any opportunity I can to say that. Yeah, I'll take that chance. Yeah, yeah. Music is a, um, you know, a real strength of, of Brisbane, and, and obviously you're a, you're a major contributor to that. Do you want to talk a little bit about where you see the future opportunities for music in Brisbane and beyond? Yeah, I think... Um, thanks, Joel. I think, as we all know, the, the road to 32 is a great opportunity for all of Queensland and particularly the music industry. I mean, we've had two of the worst years known to any industry, so I think it's a great opportunity to set, the, set a new, new benchmark and start working towards helping recover first, firstly and then develop strong relationships as well. I think one of the music industry issues was we didn't have strong relationships with government, and that was proven by some of the funding at the beginning of the pandemic. For me, I'd like to, um, I'd like to see Brisbane become the live music capital of Australia, if not the world, um, and really shake Melbourne a bit. I think, they've, I think they own that too much. I'm not really happy with that. Um, so, I mean, they own sport as well, apparently, so I'd like to challenge them both of those at some stage. Um, I think the way you can do that is by having... collaborating music with sport. Everyone, I love sport. I go, I, go, I go to the cricket, I go to the football. I'd like to go to, to see a State of Origin game and have an awesome band playing in the, in the, in the, in the forecourt there afterwards or before. Just adding music as an experience to everything you do in Queensland. Also, I think there's great opportunities with programming. I think... If we've got the Lions playing the Wallabies at Suncorp, if we know that in advance, we can program. We can put an English band on the Thursday night so you get another visitation night. All those things and opportunities, I think, if we start working together, we can create uh, longer stays and, and, also, you know, and also make a hub, prison music hub, and then it goes out to the, to, to the other cities or other you know, regional areas. I think between that and I think working with the state, the state, council, state government and the local council is really important. I think that's been a bit of a hard thing to negotiate, and I think we need to work towards that. Okay, Louise, have you got any other comments in terms of the opportunities for the arts and the tourism sector to work more closely together? I think that the fact that we're, we continue to use language that separates the two industries is, is probably the first place to stop. I think that what we're talking about is experiences, whether you've got a hotel, whether you've got... Uh, we, we all function together. We're part of the same ecology. We need to integrate in a much greater way, and that's how we change our language. I mean, just what you said then makes perfect sense why wouldn't we be programming and curating a body of work around every major sporting event and how we really capitalise on those opportunities. Uh, we have so many of those kind of... It's, it's a sort of low-hanging fruit that is just there available to us. It needs a concerted effort. It needs uh, a really um, consolidated approach. But it, it, it seems to me we're, we're absolutely on the same page. And so how do we take that further? What are the key steps? What's, you know, what, what are we going to do in the short term? Uh, we're all looking for ways to grow our audience, visitation, the economy. And that's a, a huge thing that we can contribute to uh, through the arts and culture of creating a dynamic city, cre creating a dynamic state uh, and providing opportunities to, to our young people. Uh, so they don't have to leave and, and pursue careers in, in other states uh, and, and shake off the whole Queensland cringe. It's just got to stop. We don't need to do it. We're, we're doing it anyway. Uh, and we're doing it in our way, which is what's so fantastic, and embrace that and talk about that more. Yeah, I think that there's an opportunity for some kind of brand refresh. And I'm not talking about just, you know, the graphics of promotion of Queensland and the tourism sector. I think it's a whole understanding of what we are. Uh, we've got the beaches, we've got all these fabulous weather, it's fantastic, everybody knows that, but it's the sense of a progressive place where people want to live, work and play. Um, I was involved um, as one of the, the sort of founding people to do with Dark Mofo in Tasmania. As, and Mono's behind that, <clears throat> we completely worked to transform the whole city. I mean, from a place that was really quite... It was cold and dark and nobody expected anything would go well. Even I didn't think a winter festival was a dumb idea, but a winter arts festival. But now, I mean, of course, you cannot get a hotel room. Every ticket sells out. It's built this whole brand around it. It's actually taken its weakness and turned it into its strength. And I think sometimes that the arts has that opportunity. I think, and I'm going to be frank again, Joel, that we've had a, a, a reputation in Queensland for being a bit 
kind of conservative, may I say, and I think that's an opportunity to turn that on its head and say, right, are we going to be the queer capital of, of Australia? Are we going to be the place that's progressive in all of its kind of way that it's embracing new ideas and propositions? I think we need to surprise the world with a new understanding of who we are and the kind of complexity and the diversity that exists in this community. Um, we're very grown up now. I don't give a shit about Sydney and Melbourne, let's, let's be honest. I'm not interested. That was the most exciting thing to return after 18 years, is to see that there is this boldness, this sense of self and confidence. And that what has what's attracted me back to here. That's our strength. We need to own it and we also need to be honest about who we have been. So that's how the arts can play a role, I think. We have a, an important role to tell that story. Fantastic. So we've, and we've covered that terrain in terms of the event side of peace at the moment, and there's definitely a bias in Queensland, whether it's conscious or not, and it may be active in other states as well, for the reason that big events and funding big events are a way of generating bed nights and being able to measure that in a demonstrable way. But equally, the great cities uh, and, and towns and provinces and counties of the world have an authentic day-to-day -day culture that is equally immersive for the visitor. So that you can turn up in X place and you know when you get off the plane, if you just wander into a precinct, that there is going to be something of value to do there that doesn't necessarily involve a $100 ticket. It can just be what it's like to wander into a bar in Paris and there's some jazz band playing there that's authentic. I'm interested to hear from everyone, and I mean, Kate, I might go back to you first. You're obviously running a venue year round that has to have a real diversity of product and different ways of engaging with community. What, what are the challenges and opportunities that you see on a kind of day-to-day -day basis ar around the venue in terms of that? Well, I think the big challenge for us is, and so Brisbane Powerhouse, fantastic, beautiful building but we have to grow new audiences all the time we have to work on that you know it, we've got to find points of entry for people to come and experience new experiences we don't have huge budgets to do that we've got to sell a proposition which is not got a lot of budget behind it but how we do that is by building a sense of what the whole precinct delivers and that's probably a lesson that uh, i've took away from working at dark mofo I am working on a whole strategy um, with our board, with our organisation, to make that place an experience. It isn't a place you come and see a show and you leave. We are going to have an unfolding in the next year of a lot of exciting events, and a lot of them are tourism-based events. Uh, they're destination events, but you come, you experience, there's lots going on. You can enjoy them if you're a serious hardcore arts lover at the highest level, or if you're just someone who's got no experience at all, there's still so much in it for you. And that's what I loved about Dark Mofo and Mona. It's very egalitarian. Everybody is welcome. But the ideas are still there. The artwork is still of that standard. But people can enjoy it on how and the terms they choose. And that's what I like about Queenslanders. They can just do it as they want to. So I'm trying to sort of instill those, those values. And I've got some great support and funding from Brisbane City Council, the federal government, state government, to start to let's turbocharge this thing and, and really um, find our sense of place and meaning in that, in that space. Fantastic. Louise, from a festival perspective, I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding in people that don't work on festivals that this is an always-on engagement process with community. How do you think that the, what, the, that process of continuous engagement in building the festival contributes to um, the development of the, the grassroots of the sector that then, then can spread out to have more of an always-on impact in the city? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. We've got... Three, three and a half weeks in the marketplace, but the campaign really starts from, depending on whether the show has a longer run, uh, it might, the campaign might start six months earlier. But one of the things that's really challenging for every industry, and, and again, this came up this morning, was this sense of last minute buying uh, and the change in consumer habit. 
and how you change the course of action halfway through a campaign or a strategy that you thought would work, but actually the market changed halfway through that strategy. Uh, that's where a festival can be incredibly exciting and dynamic because a festival can, can quickly be responsive and adapt and change. Uh, but it's co consistently staying relevant, keeping connected in community, whether it's making work with community that then has an outcome during the festival. What Coming back to audiences, uh, one of the biggest shifts that we've seen in the Brisbane Festival this year was a 45% growth in the Brisbane Festival audiences uh, aged between 18 and 35, which is excellent and something we're thrilled, but how are we then bringing those audiences on a journey all year round, keeping them, going to other things and how we all collectively work together so they're engaging at the powerhouse, uh, going to the Fortitude Musical, which that's probably where they're coming from to go to the Brisbane Festival, but the point is how we work collectively as an ecology. The interesting thing though is a lot of the events that we're doing, and this is where it can be a bit of a conundrum because we are taking these big free experiences out to communities across across the city to build our audiences and that's where they, they are growing and coming from. How we then turn them into a ticket buyer who comes and sees a show in a venue uh, in a more traditional context is something that we really need to think very cleverly about how we build that, that audience. Uh, and I think that the other great thing about when you're creating things from a grassroots point of view, you're really giving a visitor a great insight into who the people are of that city. How, how do they interact with their suburb? What's the hot spot that's not written into the travel guide? And they're the great experiences that the arts and culture can deliver in a really interesting way through storytelling and connection. JC, you're operating a venue that needs to happen year round regardless of big event or small. Mm. What are the challenges for you at the moment in terms of engaging your audience and keeping them coming back? I think legislations, some of the rules around venues has always been a tough one for us with um, the scanning. Look, we don't have scanning, but I think the precinct has scanning, which is not great for, I don't think it's very good for tourism either. Um, the challenges are, I mean, a lot of our challenges are that the, um, there's a lot of stuff in the market at the moment for been, hasn't been tours for two and a half years, so there's uh, a lot of touring happening, and the domestic market's actually, unfortunately, really missing out in ticket sales. Um, but I think the th things like the Valley, for me, it's really important to recognise that as a hub for music, the industry in Queensland. I think we shouldn't play around with it too much. I think we should um, make sure we don't make high-rises and then complain about the noise downstairs. I think that's something... I know it's more of a city council problem, but think we all have to agree on that. That's ridiculous. Um, so I think they're, they're the challenges. And I think if, you know, if we can recognise that we need to look after it, protect it. Because if I'm coming from New South Wales and Sydney, I'm up here to play golf or something. I might come up the night, night before, just go up with some mates in Brisbane, just, just go to the valley. Because you just go to a gig, any, anywhere, any bar. The choice is yours in the valley and the other precincts around, around Brisbane, around the valley as well. So I think we've got to look after that. And that's one of the challenges, moving in with the development of what's going on in the valley. I think that's something we need to really be careful about. I spoke earlier about the Olympics as a gravitational force that is dragging us all towards it. Um, certainly in terms of the work uh, that we're doing around Queensland Music Trails, our focus is around dispersing people as you know far throughout Queensland as possible and using music as the mechanism to do that. In, in terms of the Olympics as an opportunity for this sector, what, what, what do we see as the key priorities of things that we want to see um, evolve over the next decade to get us to a point where we can deliver something to the standard that visitors will expect when they come? Anyone? Well, I think, first of all, we need to absolutely honour building on our strengths, and that needs to start now. We need Brisbane to, when people are, are Googling it uh, and Queensland, all they're seeing is, oh my goodness, I, I wasn't expecting that. I was, the playfulness, the, excite, the kind of unexpected nature of what it is that we are doing and start to build. 10 years isn't a long time and so how we build capacity, how we start to really enable uh, a whole state to get ready for this opportunity so that the whole of this you know, the, the, 
my son, who will be 19, how this is his opportunity uh, and how we're fostering that now. Uh, it absolutely needs to start at this critical moment how we're building our local First Nations stories and being able to deliver those incredible stories in with the highest of production values that we've done all of the community consultation, that we're being led by elders, the protocols are in place, all of that needs to be happening immediately uh, to really maximise and take advantage of this absolute once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I agree with you. I think the really important point is what you said, not to be tokenistic. We need to dig in now and, as we touched on at the start of the, the um, talk, that we need to set the record straight and start from now. It's going to be too late if we, don't, if we, if we wait five or seven, ten years, so let's get into it now. Um, <clears throat> I'd just say, look, I think we need to really articulate, paint a picture of what we expect to see as a legacy and start there and then work backwards from there so that this is a tool, this is a strategy to have the Olympic Games... Uh, for us to, you know, realise some big new opportunities for our community. And I don't think... We, we don't know yet. We don't know what that looks like. And I feel that we do, if you talk about practical actions, it's like a strategic planning session. You've got to paint your vision of where you want to be and what's that going to look like. So who is going to participate in that? We need to be takeaways, to, to move to takeaways from today's session. Um, we need to be putting together the sorts of teams that actually are cross cross-sector teams to start to articulate that vision, consider our, our strategies to get there uh, and, um, you know, really telling the story to the community of where we want to be. It, it's very exciting. Particularly, I think, the role of young people, and it's been discussed on other panels already today, in, in our sector, as we get older, it is really easy to become out of tune with what young people are into and consider ourselves experts. Um, I'm just wondering, it'd be interesting to hear some thoughts about how we can better engage young people to be part of the process of developing the sector and being part of um, this conversation. I mean, we've seen over a long period of time the amount of funding that's allocated to grassroots organisations shrink, and that's not just a Queensland issue, that's a national issue. Um, for a, a whole lot of different reasons, but fundamentally, I think, a bit of a misunderstanding about, you know, how the pyramid is weighted and the real importance of that foundation of grassroots activity. It, through, the, through the work that you're all doing, what are the ways that you're um, inviting young people into that space? I think you touched on a really good point. Um, we, and I've had... I get the opportunity of, of developing programs with the idea of young people in mind, and not that I'm a young person, and so that's a problem. Um, and I think there's been a dramatic shift in appetites and tastes. There always is in every, every generation, but there's particularly so. And if we're not listening to that voice, there's a problem. I think, I have to say, we, we actually do have to have investment. Um, you see Victoria is investing enormous funds in the development of different particularly arts and cultural tourism sectors. And we actually have to have the funds there. You, it doesn't just happen organically. I think people like to think it does, but it doesn't. It actually has to actively happen with an investment. So um, I think that the talent is there. I think there's phenomenal talent in Queensland, uh, but we have to consider a joined up approach to realising some of that ambition. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with Kate. I also think there's opportunities uh, to build partnerships across sectors, particularly with education and how we are working in a, in a fashion that sets up arts and culture as, as a pivotal part of, of the daily life of our young people uh, and how they're engaging with that, how we have uh, a really integrated approach from a digital and technology point of view. Uh, it's quite mind-blowing uh, for us to, to think, but it, that is the future. We've heard that already today. Uh, but again, that comes from cutting-edge design, uh, really incredible forward thinking, and that's the role that we can play and how we're guided by young people to ensure that we're engaged in a, in, a, in a way and communicate in a way that they're used to communicating within and they help co-design that model for us. 
I think the way that uh, the, I think Big Sound does that really well. I think it communicates to young musicians. Uh, you have you have key, keynote speakers, and you you buy a ticket and go to seminars like this. And I think that that really well. It's probably the elephant in the room at the moment because uh, there is a challenge for Big Sound with um, South by Southwest, which is a normally based in Austin, Texas, uh, are doing doing a program event next year in Sydney, which so um, Big Sound is under a little bit of threat in my eyes. Um, so yeah, I think that's something we I think we need to continue with funding for, for programs like Big Sound because it's the biggest um, music conference in the Southern Hemisphere, and um, we could lose it if we don't get smart and and, and protect it. I, just to add to that, I mean, I think that you've made a really important point, and again, coming back to building on our strengths, the thing that Big Sound does, it's organic, and you can feel it. It's something that it's all well and good to buy something in that's come from somewhere, but the thing that's happened in Brisbane with Big Sound is you can feel it in the air when you walk around the Fortitude Valley. It is remarkable. It's unique. You can't just manufacture these things, so we need to use what we have, build them. And, and be ahead of the game so we're not missing out on these opportunities when other governments across the country are buying in pre-made ideas, sorry, but we use what we've got and build it up because what JC's talking about is one of the most exciting times of the year, apart from Brisbane Festival, of course, uh, and the Queensland Music Festival and at the Powerhouse as well. But uh, the, the point is it, it's, a, it's a great event and, and it is a risk and how we work together collaboratively because it does generate incredible visitation for the state, uh, for the city, uh, and I think we, we need to use that to come back to what this whole conference is about, and that's building on our strengths. And, and circling back to something Kate said before, if we're trying to tell a new story about ourselves, that story has to be about ourselves, not via some other brand mechanism that has absolutely nothing to do with this place. So certainly the focus, I think, for everyone sitting on the panel here, and the, one of the key takeaways from this is that the most important thing to do is accentuate the authenticity of who we are because that's what people want to buy and engage with. They can Those other things that already exist elsewhere, people can go and have that authentic experience elsewhere, but we are underselling our strengths by not going with them, essentially. Um, We've got about five minutes left. I'd just be interested to, to turn our attention a little bit to, um, you know, some of the more strategic issues facing... Uh, well, I guess the tactics more so about how arts and tourism can sort of operationally work together um, in a more kind of integrated way. So certainly with what we're doing with Queensland Music Trails, the whole construct is about using music as a hook to get people to pay attention to a whole lot of other experiences that are going on in a joined up way. I'm just wondering through the work that you're all doing, what you're thinking currently is at the moment about ways you can um, use your um, arts activation as a service to people providing other experiences as well. So in terms of um, leveraging the audience that you're bringing in to then create opportunities for, for other experience providers? Look, I, um, I don't think we know also in the arts industry well enough how to engage. It's The tourism industry is a monolith to us. Um, we're trying to also push our way in. I guess we're trying to find ways for the tourism industry to see what we offer and how we can extend that extra night or that, you know, actually bring people as a destination. Um, I think we have to find forum, fora to, to engage. I don't quite know how that is. I haven't understood that in Brisbane yet, but it's essential. I saw how it worked at Dark Mofo and with tourism agencies in Tasmania. And because it's a smaller place, you can sort of get your hands around it a bit. But there was ways that it happened organically. There was formal structures that happened in terms of there were some really clever ideas about, you know, you turn the city red for the, the whatever occasion. That's a, a, a tactical example. And everyone lights up their buildings red during Dark Mofo. And then it happened all over the state. They'd, they'd light up buildings everywhere, even though it was nothing to do with Hobart, where the centre was happening. So there's some big creative ideas I think we can all lean into. But again, I would stress, our strength is 
we still have a small connected supportive community and that's where we have to, to work with. We cannot be too competitive with each other in order to realise some of these big ambitions. Louise? I think you said it before when you kind of opened up this part of the conversation around leveraging and I think that what we are doing is uh, creating these extraordinary, whether they're productions or major exhibitions uh, like GOMA presents, for example, the musical economy that we know brings a lot of tourists to to Brisbane, but through festivals, events, concerts, etc., and how collectively they can be leveraged in a way that I don't think we're doing to the full extent right now. There are moments in the year that stand out, that are iconic, that are uh, consistent. So, state of origin, if it's in Brisbane or a major game or River Fire, for example, they're iconic, they're consistent, we can bank on those. It's then starting to be creative, think laterally about, well, what else is happening and how do we package those things up? So while you are here for whatever it may be, you spend an extra night here. And, and, and we've heard all the research, you've heard it probably um, more so than we have, but having people stay an extra night brings so much more to the to the local economy so how we're actually using what we already have and then building upon that building upon it in a way that uh, changes people's perception of Brisbane, Queensland or wherever it is in the state. Uh, I think that uh, a point Kate said earlier around turning our weaknesses that we think are perceived weaknesses but actually turning them on their head could actually be a really interesting opportunity and playing to the strengths of this kind of playful, more laid-back culture that we have in Queensland and how we can leverage that in the work that we do and, and make sure that there is a real authenticity and it's not just a, a kind of um, replica of something that's been successful somewhere else. Open communication, continue to talk to each other. The fact that this panel's even happening uh, today I think is a really great step in the right direction. Clearly there's an appetite for a, a joint venture, a way in which we want to grow together in the lead up to the Olympics and then beyond that. Uh, I think that the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast exemplified what uh, a great a way in which the the Commonwealth Games did an enormous thing for the, for the Gold Coast and that is... Uh, a great example to lead from and, and the infrastructure that went into place, both soft and hard infrastructure, was really considered uh, well in advance and, and clearly that's what's happening here today. So I've gone off onto lots of different tangents but basically bringing it all back together that we could just keep talking to each other and then not just talk but act. Any final comments? I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, I think just treat the industry a bit, the arts industry and music industry more like sport and horse racing gets treated. Uh, I think... Um, start having these conversations with TEQ or BETA and invite them into our tent so they can understand what we do and what we're trying to do. And that's all I'm happy with that. Great. Well, that actually brings us to over 35 seconds. So we'll um, bring it to an end there. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you um, can recognise from everything that's been said on stage today, the art sector is incredibly enthusiastic about working very, very closely with tourism to realise our, um, our shared goals. All the best. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.